Good morning. So good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Glad you were able to be here. I uh, want to mention to you some things that, um, that, that we've got done, like things that are going to be going on and everything. Um, I'm just so glad to be able to be back uh, from camp meeting. But I've got to tell you that um, Arkansas camp meeting this year was one of the most incredible ones we've ever had. Every single sermon was powerful, refreshing in its own way. And, and um, I know some of you may have gotten to watch online, but uh, just some incredibly, incredibly powerful things. Um, powerful service. Um, tomorrow evening, um, our ladies will be doing wings, and the wings ministry will be getting together at six o'clock. I believe it is salad night for the ladies at wings, and so um, I know that, that you guys are looking forward to that. The men will be having our men's life at six twelve. Uh, men, you and bring anything. We're going to be having pizza um, for men's life. The ladies will be having salad. Men are going to be having pizza. Okay. And so, um, you know, if you want dessert, you can bring that. Um, if you got pizza, you don't have to have dessert. Um, but we're going to have, how many of you guys like pizza? You like pizza? I, I mean, guys, I'm playing. So Y'all get salad, okay? Right. How many of you men? How many of you men like pizza? What men like pizza, okay? You like pizza? Okay, then that's what we're doing at 6 o'clock tomorrow evening for the men. I think, I think if you're going to. Uh, Eat pizza, you need to have salad as an entree. So I think we ought to mix this thing up, you know. Bring your own salad. Uh, so, we're, uh, but then, uh, so, so we're just we're excited. We're having a great time with our fellowships and, and just the more the more. I want to remind you on June 20th, I know you see it um, on the screen, our blood drive that we have and it's going to be on June the 20th. Um, look, even if you can't sign up to give blood, um, share it. Get some of these flyers that we have out here um, because that blood drive is incredibly important to us, incredibly important uh, for not, not just us, but for, for our community and for um, people who need that. And it is something that is absolutely necessary. Again, that's going to be June the 20th from 1 to 5. And, and so, um, get word out. We do have some flyers out there. Some of you can pick up some flyers and, and take them uh, some different places. That, uh, if you have a business, take a blood, a, a blood donation flyer to that. Uh, if you work someplace in some other area, take one. And um, because we just want to get those out. If you're on Facebook, share our Facebook post. Even if you can't get one, share it. Um, I think right now we have 20 people who are signed up. Um, our goal is only 16, but I will really, really need to have at least 30 signed up. We would love to see us even surpass our uh, best blood drive yet, which is 27 units. And think that 27 units of blood would help 81 people. Imagine that. 27 units of blood would help 81 people. That would be incredible, wouldn't it? Um, and so every bit's going to help somebody. We want to go forward in prayer, and we have several prayer needs. I know, I know there's lots of prayer needs, but um, remember J.C. Aldridge in prayer, and he, just a couple months ago, he had pneumonia, and he's got a bacterial infection, and, um, and it, you know, he's got to go back to Barnes Jewish in the, uh, next week, and, and so remember Brother J.C. in prayer. He gets prayer, and he really sounded rough. Sister Mary, um, uh, battle. She's actually been to the ER the last two Saturdays in a row, and um, she, the only can tell her she's got diabetes, but um, she needs prayer, and she needs a healing, and, um, and Sister Wanda still just not doing well, and um, sick, and, and so forth, and um, Sister Diane is still recovering from that knee, the fall that she's had, and now she's got a, a, an infection that's set up in that. And so remember her and Brother Jerry in prayer. Uh, I know Sister Loretta's aunt, Betty Kelton. She used to live around here. She lives, I believe, in, um, she's in a mountain home now, that area flipping, and um, fell yesterday. And she's uh, kind of a woman that need, needs, a, needs a touch from God. And also, we ask that you remember um, the Jimmy Cole family. Jimmy Cole is a, a uncle to Jim Gifford that comes to church here. And, uh, Scott Newford, and he, he passed away 
um, this morning, and their family needs prayer. And we'd ask that y'all remember to do prayer. So I ask you to stand on your feet. We want to go for a word of prayer. You know God hears prayer. I said, how do you know God hears prayer? Here's prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you today, and we thank you, dear God, for the wonderful opportunity to come into your house, dear God, to call on you. To magnify you, dear God. We, we love you, dear Lord, and we praise you, dear God. And Lord, we thank you, dear God, for every good thing, dear God, that you do in our lives. So much, dear God, and so powerful, so wonderful, dear Lord, that you do great things. God, I pray that you would touch the needs of the demons, dear God. I pray that you touch the Gifford family, dear Lord, this lost, dear God. You would minister to them, dear Lord. I pray for Brother JC, dear God. Give him a healing, Lord. God, I pray for Sister Mary, dear God. Lord, just give her healing in her body. Give her strength, dear God. Lord, I know she just needs relief from this, dear God. I pray for Sister Wanda. Lord, I pray, dear God, for the conditions that she's got, Lord, that you would strengthen her, dear God. For, Lord, for Sister Diane, dear God. Right now, we just pray that you would touch that me. And Lord, give her healing for it, dear God. Lord, for Sister Kelton, dear God. Lord, we pray for healing for her, dear God. That you would minister to her. And God, I pray right now for these, dear God, that are here, that you would minister to each one of them. Those, dear God, who are traveling, dear Lord. Those, dear God, who, dear Lord, are like Brother Robin, dear God, who, who stay, dear God. We pray for, for, for others, dear God, who may be traveling, who may be going through different trials. Lord, we know that you are with us, dear God. We know that your hand is on us, dear God. We know, dear God, that you're going to touch them in a special way. In Jesus' name. Hey, before they lead us in worship, I think we'd like one thing. There's something going on next Sunday. I almost, almost forgot about it. Till Father's Day. Father's Day. Now, you know, we say Mother's Day, you get a big, giant, clap, and round of applause. Father's Day is important too, right? Father's Day is important too. Hey, Dad, we're going to be here um, next week. We've got several things that we're going to be doing. One, we're going to have a drawing. We did for Mother's Day. We're going to draw in for some gift cards for restaurants. Hey, if your kids don't take you out, you're not going to the drawing. You get to go out and eat that, okay? Um, but then we're also, we've got some special things that we're going to be doing that the ladies are helping with to take care of for you dads. And so you are going to be here for that. And, uh, you know, we're going to be sharing a special message about hero dads. You know, every dad is a hero. They do what they're supposed to do. Uh, you know, not Superman, not, not Batman, not Iron Man, but dads. Because none of those were called, but dads are called to be dads. So next week's Father's Day. Um, so fathers, if you come here and invite your kids to be with you. Um, if you don't people invite your dads to be with you. Uh, you like people, your dads to the Bible, don't give anything to have my dad with me on Father's Day. And so every time you get a chance, do that. Let's worship the Lord.
glad that this is free. We're going to get ready. We're going to worship with our giving and our tithes and then our offering. You know, um, when I think about giving, there's so many different things that come to my heart and come to my mind. And, 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 and one of them is a lot, every one of us know what the word invest means, right? And, 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 you know, for everybody, investment is different. You know, some people, their investment is their retirement accounts. It may be an IRA. It may be some kind of a, uh, it may be some kind of 401 and invest. You know, people talk about investing in stocks and bonds and things like that, right? Um, for everybody, investment is a different type of thing. And, and when we talk about giving, I do use the word investment, but investment is the same thing as sowing. It's the same thing as sowing seed. Years ago, a pastor man, he was a FedEx airplane inspector named Brother Hope. And that Brother Hope was very close to us, close to our family. Brother Hope was a, uh, he was a tremendous giver. Now, you've got to imagine, he was the airplane inspector that inspected turbine engines on those planes. So, you can imagine, that's a good, good paying job. Very well paying job. Well, Brother Hope and his wife had a stroke and had some issues. She became homebound for seven years. But you know what? For seven years while she was homebound, they could come to church maybe once or twice in a year. We didn't have video um, services. You didn't have online uh, where they could watch services online. So you didn't think of that. You know, they, they would get maybe the tapes or CDs and sometimes hear that. But now, uh, we've got visited with them real often. Um, Katie Beth was little, she'd go over there and, and pray with Sister Home and, you know, they're, they're a precious family. And, and we would have such great times together. But, you know, as a pastor, I never felt like I was a bill collector or a tithe collector. I didn't go over there and collect tithes, but he would ask me if I didn't come by, he'd call me and say, From Banky, I need you to come by and get my tithe check. Every month he wanted to make sure. And he told me this one time. He said, you know, he said, he said, I have this philosophy that I don't want to die for the rapture to take place. I have to pay my tithe. He said, I want to make sure I, uh, I'm not where I need to be with God. Who's that important to me? And so, and he still worked. He hired somebody full time to come to say, faithfully taking care of God's business, taking care of his body. Well, at 73 years old, he got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. He had to retire from FedEx. And as he retired, I thought, okay, you know, he's, it's time for him to rest. And he came to me and he said, Pastor, he said, you know, he said, I've retired. He said, I want to be able to tie the same amount that I've been tied while I work. He said, but my income's going to be half. I said, well, you can't tie the same amount. And he looked at me and he said, just hush. And then he said, he said, I got a letter in the mail the other day. Now, I've never had anybody do this. He showed me his personal portfolio. He showed me what he had in his retirement account. I thought, well, you're all right. You're all right. And, um, I mean, he had a good amount of retirement. And he said, I got a letter in the mail from an investment company. Well, you know, they send those to people all over the place. And he said, they gave me a stock tip. Want me to sign up with them and... And, and, and they gave me a stock tip, and I can, and, and, and they give this one for me free, and I, I can this sign up with my pay this but I said, Brother Hope, I said, don't do that. They just want your money. And he said, hush. And he said, he said, hush. He said, he said, he said, he said, let me he said, God laid on my heart to give something to world missions, and I always going to bless this. He said, God, I'm going to do what I've always done for the church. I want to invest. And, and, and he said, so he looked at me, and I thought, well, he, he's going to learn the hard way he's going to lose his money. And he goes and he follows their stock, and he moves a bunch of his money over into this stock. I thought, well, he'll learn. The next month, he didn't come back to tell me he told me so or anything. He said, well, thank you for that stock I told you about. Yes, sir. He said, I made $18,000 last month. He said, guess what? I can tithe like I always have. And that's what he said every time. I said, you know, Brother Hope, don't ever listen to me again when I talk to you about your money. I said, listen to God. I said, you need to listen to God. Do you know what? The, Paul said this. He said, and whoever sows bountifully also reaps bountifully. 
You can change the word soul. You can change that to invest. Whoever invests bountifully will reap bountifully. Now the beginning of that verse talks about another part of that. I thought I would mention another part because we're going to be bountiful. We're not going to do the sparing of stuff on it. When we honor God, I want to have that heart. For one, I want to be able to give. I asked God at the beginning of this year. When we were going to in person, there some different expenses. I said, at the beginning of this year, I said, God, I said, I know my daughter's getting married. And, you know, I mean, you know, daughters are not cheap. They're not cheap. And I said, I said you know what, God? I said, I'm not going to take your money and put it in wedding money. I said, I won't be able to give it more this year than I did last year. And I believe in investing. I believe, in, I believe it's a good investment to send into the kingdom of God. And you know, not only have you done that with your tithe, this week, when I was in the camp meeting, done primarily on Wednesday night and Mother's Day, I took $1,300 to give to World Missions at camp meeting. You know, did you know what happened with that $1,300? That $1,300 is going to go toward 60 people giving their hearts to the Lord from this church. That's investment. Isn't it? So, as you get ready to worship it on the day, I want you to think about how you sow. If you want to do something that blesses God, I don't want to do a very general, I want to do something that blesses God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to bring our gifts to you, to honor you as a dear God, Lord, to worship you as a dear God. And Lord, as we sow, as we invest in the kingdom, dear God, I know you're going to bless every giver. Whether we do it through the in these budgets, whether we do it online, whether we mail it in, we're going to honor you, dear God. And we bless you in the name of Jesus. Right now, would you worship the Lord with your name?
Show me your love. 
to stir them up. And the Bible says in Acts chapter number 17, Acts is a transitional book in the Bible. It is the book where the church is established and the church is built. The rest of the New Testament follows up the book of Acts. Paul's writings happen during the book of Acts. Just a part of verse 6, Paul and Silas have turned the rest of the world upside down. And now they are here disturbing our city. God, I ask that you would speak to the church as I share what you laid on my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. As you look at the beginning of this particular passage, you'll find that they actually asked Paul and Silas to leave. They asked them to leave their city because, as this word says, they turned our city upside down and they're disturbing our city. You see, the reason Paul and Silas were disturbing the city is because they were disturbed about their city. And God's been getting dealing with me, you know, I don't know, and I... And I'm going to ask you the question, this is not a question for you to answer, it's for you to answer in your heart. But are you disturbed by the things that you see around you in your city, in the community, in the nation, in the world? You see, we can watch the news or we can listen to the news or listen to podcasts and read Yahoo or whatever it is and, 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 and see the things going on and we can get really mad about things that are going on in the world. But being mad and being disturbed are two different things. You see, we get mad at things and we do nothing about it. But when you get disturbed about something, you decide you're going to do something about it. And the problem is we... We get disturbed and we try the wrong things to do. I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just me, but I'm disturbed by the conditions of some things. And it's not just, oh, oh, oh we want to touch them, we want to just point to Washington, D.C. But it's not just Washington, D.C., it's right here in Blythe, Arkansas. It's in little communities like Arborell. It's in it's in Mississippi County. It's in all of these different places. It's in, it's in the Blue Hill, Missouri. But I'm disturbed by the morality of the day. Amen. Or the lack of it. Amen. Rather, I would say the immorality of the day. I'm disturbed by that. I'm disturbed by the attitudes of the world. That says, you know what, anything is okay, do whatever you want to do. The absolute acceptance of sin and sinfulness. You know, we can accept sinners and we should accept sinners however they come. But the acceptance of sin, and, and, and really it's not just the acceptance of sin in the world that, that I'm disturbed about, but I'm disturbed about the acceptance of sin amongst God people. Yeah. We just accept anything is all right. You know, we live in a day that disturbs me when the LGBTQ has more influence in the schools than the Word of God does. Oh, <coughs> not that's not just California schools. That's not just schools in New York City, but right here in. Arkansas. The top priest. I'm disturbed. I'm disturbed of the, of, of the so called confusion about gender. I don't, I'm not going to lie to you. And this might be a little blunt, but my dogs have no problem figuring out what gender they are. <laughs> Copper knows she's a boy, and Susie knows she's a girl. And therefore, that's why we have bear. But we're men. Young people are having their minds infiltrated to let them to, to think that, 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 oh, you know what? You, that, that you got confusion amongst your gender. That is a lie from the devil. And it ought to disturb us. Right. Amen. <coughs> 
scared people. We ought to be disturbed by the senseless slaughter of pre-born babies as being accepted as normal. And again, it's not so much the work that disturbs me. It's how the church responds and thinks about it that disturbs me these days. I, I mean, when Roe v. Wade was overturned last year, there were people that got so mad that so I got so furious over people that, 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 that they want pre-born babies to die so bad that they got mad about that and they have anything ever. Not because they want to protect the rights of a woman, but because they want the, the baby to be killed. I'm just going to be mad until they kill them. Does that not disturb us? I mean, the mentality of that, the anger of that, People refuse. I'm disturbed by this. People refuse to walk in forgiveness these days. They'll hold on to stuff and hold on to stuff and hold on to stuff. People would rather go to hell than forgive. I had somebody tell me that. Last year, I'd rather go to hell than to forgive. That disturbed me more than anything I've ever heard in my life. Are we disturbed about the brokenness of families? Are we disturbed about the deception put in the minds of children, teenagers, and college students? Are we disturbed by violence and murder on our very own streets? Or do we just want to say, oh, criminals are going to do what criminals do? Does it not disturb us? Does sinful behavior disturb us? Does hatred and vitriol disturb us. Are we disturbed enough about racism? Oh, wow. We're in church all here talking about that. Are we disturbed enough about racism to do something about it? To remind people that God could care less what color we are? Oh, wow. I knew I, I didn't come here to get in the way of men, but I came here to share the truth with you. Are we disturbed about all the hate that we see in the world? And not, not again, in our own community. Are we disturbed that we live in the most biblically illiterate time in church history? And again, in the church. People need to know the word of God. Does it not disturb us that people can't find their answer to the word? Are we disturbed about living in a world without absolutes and without a solid belief system or even a lack of doctrine? When I had somebody several years ago, and it was it's been 15 years ago, a, a young man came to me and, and he was being influenced by, by a doctrine that that was not correct. And I told him, I said, well, this is what these people believe. And you know what the young man told me? He said this. He said, he said, well, I don't care what they believe as long as I feel good. Listen, if you just come to church to feel good, you're not getting what you need. We're not here to feel good. We're here to get uncomfortable so we can be disturbed, so we can be changed. And you need to be uncomfortable today. You need to be uncomfortable when God's working on you. This is not getting in our easy chair at our lazy boy recliner and kick it back and say, God, bless me. This is us wanting to make a difference. This is us wanting to follow God. And these disciples put everything on the line because they were not comfortable. We need to get disturbed around our community. Do, do you think that Bible needs the churches? To make a difference, you see, one church can't do it. But do you think we need the churches to make a difference? We need, to, we need to be willing to make a difference. I mean, we're living in a time that's out of control. But we have the one who's in control, who's in our hearts. And all we've got to do is get disturbed enough to change things. But you listen to me. When you get truly disturbed, 
Not everybody's going to love you for it. In fact, if everybody loves you for it, you're not disturbed enough. Here's what's happening. We're all concerned. The world's getting worse. From, listen, I'll tell you, the world's not getting worse. Oh, you just described it. No, what's happening is they're getting uncovered. See, these things were always there, but they were covered up. They were hidden under the covers of people's lives, under the cover of the church, under the cover of other things. But it's not that the world's getting worse, it's getting uncovered. We're seeing it. Now we know what we're fighting against. Now we know what we what we have to battle. Now we know the things that, you see, these other things have always been around, but it's been uncovered, and now we know we can do something. Because what God is doing is He's pulling back the veil so we can see the hearts of the mind and the minds of the world. our snooze alarm just a little bit too long. The Bible says that knowing the time that it's high time to wake out of sleep, church, we've got to wake up out of sleep and be disturbed. And we, we can't just sit back and do nothing. I mean, if, if you can just sit back and do nothing, I hope you can make the rapture. But I'm not sure if we can, if we don't get disturbed, because we're just going to sit back and watch people go to hell. We're just going to sit back and watch people and, 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 and watch people live how they want to live. The, the Bible never called us to that. You see, we're not called to make a social difference. We're not called to go and fix the social problem of the world. What we are called is to speak Jesus to this thing. What we are called is to speak Jesus into the world and let Jesus turn people around. We're to give the message that he'll turn around. But we're not called to fix all the social things. We're not called to make sure everybody's fed. We're not called to make sure that everybody has enough money in the way. We're not called to fix the world's problems. We're called speak Jesus to the problems and let him work in them. That's the wake up we've got to have. But too many times, I'm not saying we can't help people, we should help people, we, we should give food. I'm, but, I'm, but, but others saying we can't fix the problems, but we have the one who can. But we got to get disturbed. we got to get disturbed. The psalmist warned us the Psalms chapter will rise the back about walking in the ways of the ungodly. And you know who he warned about walking in the ways of ungodly? He was warning God's people. He wasn't warning the world about walking that way. The ungodly has already walked that way. He said, church, don't walk in the ways of the ungodly. We can accept the ways of the ungodly. We can accept the ungodly people, but we can't accept those ways. He warned us about staying away from the illicit things, the ungodly lifestyles. He warned us to share the gospel. He warned us to share the gospel. You see, we need to understand this. We need to understand that we're going to face things. In fact, Jesus told us in John 16, he said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. See, I think we've got this gospel given to us that tells us if we know Jesus, we're not going to have tribulation, but that is not the case. The reality is we're supposed to experience tribulation. I'm not talking about the great tribulation here. I'm talking about tribulation means trials and stuff. You're, did you know when you're saved, you're supposed to experience trials because you're saved? We're not supposed to fold up when we experience those trials. We're supposed to stand up when we experience trials. We're, we're, we're supposed to have another God in us that when things don't go our way, we don't give up. Right. You see, because Jesus said this. He, 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 he says, he said, I want you to be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know, because Jesus has overcome the world, that you don't have to go out seeking victory. You've already got victory. We've already overcome, but that doesn't mean you're not going to have trials. Because of the world we live in today, 
you're not supposed to be popular. If we're popular, if the church is popular with the world, then what's happening is we become in the world, part of the world. But we're supposed to stand out from the world. But I fear that in the day and age we're living in, that we want to be so much like the world that we've forgotten how to be different. If we're not different, why would they want to be like us? If we're not different from the night, why would the world want to be? If we're already like them, why would, we, why would they want to change? They should see the church and say, they're different. They live different. That, the reason that Paul and Silas were asked to leave is they didn't live the same way as these other folks were. And they were raising up a church that didn't live the same way as these other folks are. I get it. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have Twitter. They didn't have a thousand and one TV channels and streaming and stuff like that where they could watch and do the same things that the world does all. There was a separation there. There was a sanctification there. The reality is that God's called us to speak up. We can speak up. And, and it's not just speaking up about politics. If that's your thing, that's fine. But it goes beyond the politics of it. Because I, I, I want to tell you something. The politicians need this too. Washington, D.C. needs it. Little Rock, Arkansas needs it. The county needs it. The mayor's office needs it. They all need this. You understand? Know, they're going to have to have it. Look, the, 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 the question is, you know, what, I, what if I say something and it offends somebody? Well, I'm not going out intentionally to offend anybody, but would we rather them go to hell? Or would we rather them be offended? Because nobody that gets saved will ever get saved without getting offended first. Because God had to offend you of your sins before you ever got saved. But people get offended about being offended. And we've got to teach people that we just can't call on God, but we got to live for God and to live a right way for God, but we have to get disturbed enough to do it. Here's what we're going to do. There's going to come a time. And I believe the time is now that the church has finally said enough. <coughs> that we said enough. And that we make a sin. Isaiah said it this way. Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud. Don't be timid. Tell my people, Israel, of their sins. Isaiah said to tell the nation its sins. He said to be loud about it. Church, we've got to be loud about it. We've got to tell. Oh, but we, again, we just want to tell the people over on the East Coast about their sins. We want to tell the people on the West Coast. We don't want to tell people right here. And we don't even want to tell them the church because somebody may get upset. Well, they're talking about me. Well, listen, if they're sitting in your heart, you know what? You can get mad or you can just get right with God. I don't want to come in here with sin in my heart. I want to come in here and get clean every week. I'm here to condemn anybody. But we have to remind people that there is a truth to stand for. And that truth is the word of Jesus Christ. We, we can stand for truth and show love at the same time. In fact, we should show love and stand for truth. You know what? I don't hate the LGBTQ people. I don't hate the, 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 those people. I don't hate them. I want to share with them the goodness. And you know what? If somebody comes in this church, that, they, that they're part of that group, I want them to come in this church. I want to share with them the gospel. And I want them to know that we love them. 
but we also want them to know that it's not their actions that we're trying to clean up. First of all, we want to give them Jesus Christ so they can be saved. And then after they get saved, then they can be cleaned up. But we see somebody that's walking. We, we, we see somebody that's a transgender. And we get mad because we saw a transgender. Instead of getting mad that you saw a transgender, you go and you share with them how Jesus loves them. Let Jesus save them and then work out them being changed afterwards. A friend of mine, a pastor, a very good friend of mine, went in a coffee shop with his son. His son is backslidden. His son's prodigal. His son's a good boy. He's still a good young man. He's just not serving the Lord. I understand what it's like. And he went and had coffee with his son one day, just a few weeks ago. He went to this coffee shop. And I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm going to try to get back with you. I need you to hear this. He went to this coffee shop, and the person that waited on him was a transgender. That's got the church guy preacher. Now, I know a lot of people who would turn and walk away. I'm not going to let them wait. And that person waited on to his order. And he talked to that person. He was kind to of that person. Knowing the lifestyle of that person is wrong. But he was he, he started the conversation, told him where his church was. Buy that person to church. And treat that person like that person was a person. Person's obviously in sin. He went and sat down with his son, and his son said, Dad, you were so nice to that guy. You were so nice to that person. He said, A lot of church folks were today. He said, Well, what did you expect from your son? Did you expect him to be ugly to him? He's, he's trying to witness to his son. And his son saw that he said, Yeah, I believe that's wrong, son. I believe what he's living is wrong, absolutely. But I don't have to be ugly to him. I can still show you love. How much do you think that it's not going to be long before that boy comes back to the Lord because he sees his dad showing real love to somebody? And if, they, if that person standing behind that desk at that coffee shop gets saved, you know what? Then, after Jesus comes into that person's heart, then that person can change. Don't ever expect him to clean people up before they have the blood in their life. Because it's impossible to get clean without the blood. You didn't get clean without the blood. And in fact, even though he washed away your sins, I bet you were perfect after you got saved. I'm preaching better for shouting right now. But I'm still preaching the truth. Sometimes we've got to say enough. Enough. God is raising you up. He's raising the church up for this time. And we can't miss it. Folks, I hear people say all the time, it's the worst phase in the history. This is not the worst time in the history of the church. Listen to me. This is the best time to be part of the church in the history of the world. Why would you say that, Pastor? There's so many laws people. There's so many people out there. You know what that just tells me? Is there are lots of people out there that's lost? That means there is a great harvest to be had that we've got to be a church and the people of God have to look at it. Not look at the bad of it. Not look at all the terrible. The turn of say saying not be disturbed. It's not Are we 
be more concerned with being comfortable than we are the condition around us. Well, hey, I, I, I'm just going to be comfortable. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to say anything about it. I just don't know how to deal with it. How do we deal with it? Let's speak to Jesus. Let's live for Jesus. Let me ask you how many of you in here have a child? A grandchild or a great grandchild? I'm not talking about I'm not this question. Do you have a child or a grandchild? That's not serving the Lord. How many of you have one? A lot of us, right? Now, how many of you want that person to serve the Lord? Let me ask you this. If your child or your grandchild, and they've done some things that are wrong and they're not serving the Lord, they show up at your house and all the bad or all the call. I'm hungry. Would you fail? Would you? Stand up. 